Hi, welcome to Financial Fluency. Today I am talking to Rachel Nackness, who is the international best-selling author of The Face of Business and the founder of Best Dressed Image and Color Consulting. Hi, Rachel. How's it going today? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm good, and I'm excited to talk to someone in Philadelphia. I used to live in Philadelphia myself. Uh, how are things in Philly right now? Um, it's interesting. The, the sort of uh, culture in Philly is really changing a lot lately. I don't know if you've been back recently, um, but there's just a lot of development. There's a lot of like um, that, that kind of old thing where people from like the South and the Midwest would like traditionally come to the East Coast and go to New York. Well, New York has kind of priced a lot of people out. So we're getting a lot of really interesting, just kind of like new blood in Philadelphia. It's becoming like a lot more hip. Areas that were, you know, not very developed for as long as I've lived here, which is in this area most of my life, um, are really different now. So that's cool. Hmm, yeah. Let's see, the last time I was there, I, th I think it was 2015. And I remember going to Clark Park in West Philly. Uh -huh. And when I lived there back in 98, it was like um, where people went for blowjobs and heroin. <laughs> and now it's gorgeous. There was like kids playing and there were chess tables set up. And I was really surprised how nice it had gotten around that area. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually now live in an area that when I was in high school, you did not come here. Like, if, if you valued your life, basically, or at very least your wallet, you definitely would not have been just walking around in this neck of the woods. And now it's just, it's entirely different. So. Well, that's exciting. And I have a few friends who have businesses that used to be located in New York who have moved them down. Um, last year, I interviewed Amanda Steinberg from Daily Worth, and she's done the same thing. She moved from uh, New York down, back down to Philly. She went to Baldwin School. Um, just before we hit record, Rachel and I found out that we both spent some time at Bryn Mawr as well, which is my alma mater. Um, so we have that in common too. And you know, I was thinking, as I'm looking at you, for people who are watching this on YouTube, Rachel has a beautiful coat or sweater. Is it a coat or a sweater on? It's, it's like, shh, don't tell anyone, but it's technically a sweatshirt. Um, oh. it's, like, it's like my glamour sweatshirt. <laughs> But it looks like a, you have sort of a fur stole on and these beautiful dangly earrings. And I remember when I lived in Philadelphia, there was a synagogue in West Philly that was an antique store. Uh -huh. And I had an amazing collection of kind of fake costume jewelry that, I mean, you could find all kinds of stuff at estate sales and things. And back then there were actually places to dress up and go where you could like, you know, do 40s style and dance and here in Arizona, we don't have those things, so I don't do much of that anymore. But looking at you, you look so glamorous and beautiful right now on camera. Well, well, you guys should all go over to YouTube and check it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's so sweet of you to say. Yeah, so, I uh, obviously I love dressing up. I think that should probably go without saying, given my career path. Right, right. So tell us about your career path. Tell us how this started and what you do for people and why. Right. Um, so I... Um, it's funny because now I have to, now I'm going to explain the like Bryn Mawr transition. So I initially was going to go to school for political science and like, I don't know, like become an ambassador and change the world or something. And that's why I decided to go to Bryn Mawr. Even though all my life I had done creative stuff when I was in high school, I like sewed my own costumes and like did all kinds of, I published a comic book. I did all sorts of stuff like that. But I decided that like art was going to be my hobby and I was going to like do a serious career. And then like two years into that at Bryn Mawr, I was like, no, wait, this is not what I want. <laughs> um, I really, really missed it. I wasn't like drawing. I wasn't doing anything creative anymore. So I decided to, I tr first tried to like finagle my major into something that I would want to do at Bryn Mawr without leaving. And my advisor was basically like, listen, you need to just go to a different school. <laughs> Mm. And I think she didn't think I would really do it, but I did. Um, so I ended up applying to three schools, which were really the, the only schools I want. If I was going to go for fashion design, I was going to go to one of those schools. And my top choice was Parsons. And fortunately, I got in kind of by the skin of my teeth, I always think, because they made me take like a remedial drawing class before I was allowed to go in. But um, so I ended up at Parsons. And I loved studying fashion design. I totally thought I was going to be a fashion designer when I graduated. Um, but that's not 
Um, I, I mean, I did actually do that for a little while. I would, I, but I imagine myself like, you know, working with somebody who was showing on the runway and, and that's not what happened. I ended up freelancing. Um, but what was interesting was that even though I was always so into style, I was always super creative. I was like privately always in melodrama over my own personal style. <laughs> like mornings were a nightmare. Even just getting ready to go to school, you know, at Parsons, I would be changing out of, you know, four different outfits and then end up miserable with what I had on anyway. And like, just kind of want to crawl under the desk at Parsons um, instead of continuing to like stand there in class in the outfit that I ended up in. And I, and like people still responded to my style, but I felt miserable about it. Um, and I never quite understood exactly why that was. Um, and like that pretty much went on through after I graduated for the couple of years I worked as a freelance fashion designer, I worked as a freelance costume designer. The whole while dressing myself was drama, like in a very private way that was sort of only I knew about, but was definitely still affecting my life in a big way. Um, and then just sort of like um, accidentally, I discovered some of these tools that kind of go back to like, you know, the 40s and 50s, probably earlier, but that's where I can trace them to, um, that were geared towards kind of just working like with going towards what you already have going on. Um, and by learning these tools and incorporating them in my own personal style, everything kind of shifted for me and things just became so so different in my relationship with my wardrobe and how i was dressing myself and really how i how i saw myself how confident i was in my own body image um and what i looked like on a day-to-day -day basis and um basically once that all happened i had to bring this message to the world clearly <laughs> um so i ended up training in one of those tools that i talked about um, because I knew there was always already sort of a following for that certification and that, you know, clients would kind of start emailing me as soon as I was certified and it was posted that I was certified. And that's pretty much what happened. I started my business that way. What's the certification? Um, so I am a certified 12 blueprints, personal color analyst. Um, so basically if you've ever heard of like I have probably some of your listeners, I don't know who exactly tunes in, but some of your listeners may be too young for this. Um, but if you've ever heard of like Color Me Beautiful or being a season, being like a winter or a summer or a spring or an autumn, have you ever heard of it, Jen? No, I'm really curious about this though. So it's based on your skin coloring and hair coloring and then the colors you should wear with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a it's exactly that. So the old style was like, if, you're, if your eyes are blue and your hair is brown and your skin is porcelain, you're a this. Um, and like, sometimes you can kind of get it that way. Um, but in the system that I practice, it's sort of a revised model that's a lot more scientific and based on how we actually see color. So um, we still do use season terminology, but we're really looking at the scientific qualities of color of the person. Um, and matching those up to um, the colors that they can find out in the world and makeup and hair colors and clothing that will be the most flattering on them. Mm, so that is so interesting. I love that. So um, just to let you in on a little like artistic weird thing in my life. Uh, my father's a, an artist who works with colored light. That's all he does is oh, cool. colors of light. And um, I went and saw him lecture at Parsons once when I was at Bryn Mawr. And I didn't quite see the connection because I was like, isn't it the, you know, t t Tim Gunn fashion school, Parsons, you know, school of design and all that. But um, actually that suddenly like made these little links in my brain. It's like, oh yeah, because color, colored light mixes so differently than colored paint and color, <laughs> putting makeup on your face is a totally different thing than painting color onto a white canvas. Like things that I can see look good on, on my sister say, I have some red in my skin. Like we, we totally don't, can't wear the same things because we have very different coloring in spite of like the similarities between our looks, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, I, as you're saying that, I was like, that makes so much sense. Okay, I have to hear more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of people tell me, 
oh, my coloring is identi identical to so-and-so. And I'm just thinking like, I bet it's not, right? Because our idea of what colors are identical is like those two things are both dark brown. Well, there's, you know, a thousand different dark browns at least. Mm -hmm. So which one is it? And some of them have dramatically different color properties. And even the nature of the color is in question because dark compared to what, right? Um, and so we don't see color objectively, we see it relatively. Um, so you, if you probably maybe know that from your dad, is that um, you put two colors next to each other and they change the appearance of each other. So we have to see colors in context in order to know what they truly are. And that's why I can't just, you know, I can eyeball somebody and have some guesses based on experience of draping and doing a technical way of figuring it out on hundreds and hundreds of people. But even I, like, would never say I have a 100% accuracy rate on just looking at someone and guessing what the qualities of their coloring is. Because, you know, right now, even as I'm looking at you, you know, I'm influenced by the top you have on, the wall behind you, the lighting condition in your room, the way that it's coming through on my screen. So there's so many factors. And so um, when I do a proper color analysis, we like kind of create a controlled environment so that we can neutralize those. I also use a warm filter on this light that I have over on this side of me. <laughs> I yeah. put like a yellowish filter because the white seemed too harsh. So yeah, that is so interesting. And actually my dad's biggest trick is, um, he does these sky spaces and he tries to change. So you're looking at the sky with nothing between you and the sky. There's no glass, no mirror, but he changes the lighting in the room that you're in and he can make it look purple or green or orange, the sky based on what you're seeing in the room looking yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's awesome. My, one of my favorite, I think, like art pieces I've ever seen is, um, I don't know if you've ever seen this one, but it's Olafur Eliasson. Um, and the, there's water coming down in the middle of the room, and it's just like there's this rainbow floating in the middle of a dark room when you go in. It's like an installation, and it's just like, I don't know, it's like there's something about it that's just really touched me, and it's, it's like, it, the whole thing's an illusion, right? Like, it's just light. It isn't even, it isn't even really anything. Mm -hmm. um, color's a lot like that in general. It's, it, we think it's very tangible, and we know exactly what it is, but like, it, it shifts um, so easily without us even noticing a lot of the time. Mm. Yeah, I've seen a few of his pieces at the same shows that my dad ends up at too. There you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah, Those yeah. Those light art um, shows, but yeah. Okay, so that's so neat. So when you work with someone, do you need to be in person with them in order to really see that, or are you able to do it through video? Um, so when I am doing color analysis is just part of what I do, but when I'm doing color analysis, I for sure need to be in the room with them. However, I do have a network of colleagues. Um, so sometimes what happens is um, as part of our virtual work together, I will set a client up with one of my colleagues who is local to them and they'll get in the room with them and come to the conclusion based on, you know, the method that we all follow and the tools that we all use that are um, aligned to the same properties so that we know what we're looking at basically. Hmm. Cool. That's really interesting. Okay, so as a guesstimate, obviously this will be guesstimate because we're on video and like I said, I have some coloring here. Can you make a guess for like what my coloring is like? I'm just, um, can, can so, we show people what it's like to work with you just a little right here? Sure, sure, sure. So, um, Let me move can, that you, on. can you, so we don't, sometimes people ask about this, but we don't, um, consider like a dyed hair color in the equation and the reason is I'm not like not to like out you or anything but I think oh, like no, I have roots right now <laughs> people um, see me in all stages of roots on this show because yeah. we grow up <laughs> it, it, yeah um so um so the reason for that is because even when you change your hair color your it may change this like it may create a simultaneous contrast effect with your face Mm -hmm. um, and it may change your inherent contrast level, but it doesn't change the properties of your skin tone or of your eye color. And mm -hmm. so they'll, like, even, you don't want to match, like, your dyed hair to your clothes. That's a mistake lots of people make. They go, oh, when I'm a blonde, I can wear this or that. It's like, no, it's, it looks good with the hair, but then, like, we're forgetting about the face, which I think is, like, a, 
a common beauty thing where we're thinking about how the hair looks. And it's like, I want to think about how the face looks. I want to look into people's faces, you know? Um, so, so I need to do all different colors, you know, reds and blues and greens and yellow, bright yellows and things. And um, it was hard. I, like, I felt like my face looked very, very different with different hair color. I mean, especially the redness of the cheeks. That was the main thing. If I had any acne, like some hair colors totally would bring that out. Yeah, for sure. There are going to be some colors that you could put next to your face. that are going to emphasize those sort of things. If you've got dark circles, if you've got redness in your cheeks, you know, if you've got, um, you know, crow's feet or lines in your face that you're worried about or various different things like that, you, you don't seem to be there yet, but many of my clients are. And like, I don't have nothing. I've got some some forehead action going on because I have a, a very expressive forehead. Um, expressive eyebrows, so, don't they? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so I don't seem to ever move my eyes though, so I'm doing good on these. <laughs> um, but at any rate, what is your natural hair color like? Is it like your eyebrows? Yeah, it's it's relatively dark. As a child, I was a towhead though, that, and I think that's why I've always felt like I should be blonde. Because um, when I was really little, it was quite light. But as I've gotten older, I always had the dark brows. And as I got older, it got darker and darker. So you can kind of see here at the root. It's, yeah. it's pretty dark. But when it's all the way grown out, it's not, it's not like a rich, beautiful brown. It's kind of like a nondescript dishwater color. That's, a, that's another thing that people often say when they haven't seen um, their hair color next to their color. So simultaneous contrast affects your hair color, right? Um, mm -hmm. So my hair color can look very sort of like, I don't know, it looks not in my colors, it looks lighter and it looks kind of like, like warmer and muddier in a way. It doesn't look as clear and you can't see the violet undertone that my hair has naturally in like two warm colors, especially. Um, so a lot of times um, people tend to, people tend to think medium brown hair is mousy no matter what, which just like, we don't say that about men's medium brown hair, so I kind of wonder if that's not just like a sexist to perpetuate women with anywhere, you know, between a certain level and a certain level spending X number of dollars a year on hair color. Um, but probably the odd men, you know, the mad men back in the day. <laughs> totally. They were like, how can we sell more hair color. I know. Tell every woman between who, whose hair isn't really, really dark or really, really light that her hair is mousy yeah. um, or, or red. They don't usually get that. Although sometimes, to be honest, I meet clients who are redhead and they're dyeing their hair red. And then you think, why would that be? And it's because they've never seen their natural red hair next to the right colors without the color distortion. So they're convinced that it's like drab red hair and that they need to make it brighter with hair dye. Mm -hmm. um, but like, like it's, it's as red as it, it's like, it, it's awesome. It's as red as it needs to be on its own if you just put it in the right context. So it's really interesting how um, there's like these stories kind of from the beauty industry and from the fashion industry. But, but anyway, back to you and your coloring. Um, so you have, um, like maybe medium dark hair and like kind of medium dark eyes. They're definitely not the darkest brown eyes. Do you see green in them when you're up close? Yeah. If I wear green uh, or have green around it, a bit of green comes out. My kids have much lighter greener eyes than I do. So I, yeah. I put hazel on my uh, driver's license. Right. Green. I don't know if you can see it. I'm putting my eyes up close to the screen for people. Know, we're like, we're like, whoa, this is going to be <laughs> the funniest YouTube video of all time. Um, so um, oftentimes when I see that, it can be, it could be a number of things. Um, there's a few things that I tend to think it's not. So usually, not always, but usually someone with eyes that are kind of hazel in the sense that they shift more between brown and green as opposed to the use of that word that's more between green and blue. Um, hazel eyes tend not to be um, in the seasons that we call summer. So essentially those are cool, light, and soft colors, um, which uh, many of us colloquially refer to as pastels. Um, so usually the person isn't that. They're, I could kind of go either way. There's something about you that kind of feels like a bright season to me. It could, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, medium brown hair, medium brown eyes, that's autumn. It could be, which is our earth tones, basically. But I kind of rather think that, I don't know, maybe brighter 
um, what we call clearer colors um, would look better on you. So I'm just totally guessing, right? Because I haven't, I've only seen you in what I've seen you now, and I need to make a comparison to see how you would look in something else. But this, isn't, this color isn't what I normally wear, to be honest. Can I show you my whole shirt? Just to, yeah. okay, so this is one of my kids drew this. Oh, is, that, <laughs> is it Twilight Sparkle? I think it's either Princess Celestia or Twilight Sparkle, one of them. And um, we made them a red bubble site because they, they don't want to be artists when they grow up. They want to be artists right now. So I was like, okay, we can, you know, make some things out of your stuff. Um, I love that. Uh, my, my, my mentor's kid, who's definitely a little older than your kids based on the, the illustration style, um, my mentor's kid, like, has his own, like, passive income product already, and he's, like, 11. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. She was six when she did this. She's seven now, but yeah, she loves having, it's mainly friends and family that buy it, but now and then I'll, uh, you know, I'll promote her by wearing her stuff. <laughs> yeah, so when I looked at my closet, I did one of those Cone Marie things, and I um, realized I'm, most of what I actually wear is darks, blacks, navies, grays, and then I had a friend send me a yellow shirt from her line of clothing, and um, I did a I was like a spokesmodel, you know, they interviewed me and I wore it and we did a fashion shoot for it. And I put it in my closet and I was like, this is the only yellow thing that I have. And for some reason, I just had never bought anything yellow, but it made me think about what colors I choose to wear. And I tend to choose darker colors. I think, I think most people honestly do. I mean, not all, every now and again, I meet the, the client who's, you know, emphatically dedicated to like brights or pastels or something like that um, on their own. But I think um, I think most people tend to choose neutrals, which tend to be deeper colors. They like people like black, navy, gray. I think partially just because they feel safe and also because um, people aren't often totally sure how to make outfits out of um, items that are more colorful, um, that, you know, look grown up and normal. Um, and so that's one of the really cool things about um, knowing your coloring is that um, every color that shares similar color properties will actually go with any other color that shares those properties. So it makes making outfits like super simple. What, what are the properties we're looking at? Right, so <laughs> somehow I knew that we were gonna end up talking about this. I had a premonition that we were gonna talk about this like very technical stuff <laughs> and your listeners are gonna be like snoozing. But so, um, <laughs> It, so we, in my system of color analysis, we use the Munsell system um, of scientific order of color, basically. And so in the Munsell system, color has three properties. So it's kind of like on an X, Y, Z axis. And if you have a diagram of the system, it's like a, a three-dimensional cloud type of thing. Um, and so the first property is called hue. That's how warm or cool a color is. Um, the second property is called value, that's how light or dark a color is. And the third property is called chroma, which is how bright or soft a color is. So sometimes people have a little bit of difficulty understanding the diff what's the difference between light and dark and bright and soft. Um, so, so light kind of means closer to white and dark means closer to black, whereas bright means pure pigment, so something like a, acrylic paint squeezed right out of the tube, um, mm -hmm. or like a pure like kind of pigment powder or something, um, mm -hmm. granola colors basically, and soft means um, muted. Um, usually in paint you do this with a complement, um, but it'll have a gray or a hazy or a brownish tone to it, um, and so you could think of like watercolor, for example, is a lot more muted or chalk pastel is a lot more muted as compared to those like clear acrylic kind of colors. Um, so every color has like a setting. You could think of like a thermostat dial going between extremes um, on each of those three scientific qualities of color. So when you have those settings dialed in the same, even though you're looking at different colors, you're looking at all kinds of different neutrals, you know, reds and greens and blues and purples, they all harmonize and look beautiful together as long as you're constraining them to um, a, a limited range of properties of color, if that makes sense. 
That is so interesting. I have never thought of that. Okay, so now to bring it back out, I know we've really zoomed in here. Oh, on, on so much. Part. But to bring it back out to how this affects people, because so my audience is mainly made up of women working outside of the traditional nine to five, um, a number of whom, uh, you know, I saw in your book, I was starting to read through it, and there was a, a mention of B-School, so which I went to B-School as well, a number of whom are entrepreneurs. That's just kind of like how it's ended up being. So I see people get photo shoots. I see people have people do their makeup. Um, I've had it done myself. And honestly, the most expensive shoot that I actually flew somewhere for and had all this stuff done for, I've used the least because in the end, I felt like ah, it looks, I know she made me look, you know, she made me look like something great, but it just, it ended up not feeling like me. You know, I was in a flouncy dress at one point, which I'm like, I'm just not a flouncy dress kind of person that much. I, I gave her complete artistic license. I was like, you're the artist, just go ahead, do it. And, um, and while I liked them as, as compositions, I thought the photos looked great. It didn't feel like me and I ended up not really using them. I didn't think much about color. That definitely wasn't something on my mind. Uh, I just kind of let her go ahead. But I've had other people tell me that, that they'll like, you know, do this kind of find a photographer who's supposed to do this fantastic job and then um, it not really work for them. So how do you help people who are trying to redo their style to represent not just them, but their business and feel comfortable and make it work? Like, how do you help people with all of that? This is like my favorite question on earth, I think, that I've ever, ever been asked. And it is also like the, basically the topic of my book, but I'll give you, I'll give you the three key pointers. Okay. So there's three things that you need to have kind of a firm understanding. And I'll, I think a lot of people think a stylist is just going to swoop in and know all these things for you, but mm -hmm. they don't. They have taste, but sometimes taste isn't enough. Um, in order to get the kinds of things that you're asking for, which is a true, something that looks good. You still want to look good, most of us do, um, mm -hmm. but also is a true expression of you and is aligned with your brand and your goals, especially as an entrepreneur. Um, so, so those are kind of like the, the, the three main points. The first one I call kind of setting goals. A lot of people kind of forget to set goals around their wardrobe. We set all kinds of goals for our business. You know, in this quarter, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, but we don't really set goals for our wardrobe for, you know, how we want to show up. And also um, a lot of this is like tuning your wardrobe to your ideal person because flouncy dress maybe isn't for your ideal client. That might not be the problem with it, but it might be, you know, your ideal client might not relate to that. I don't know. We'd have to have a much more in-depth conversation about it. So those are the kinds of things I like to think about as far as setting goals um, is like, you know, where are you trying to go with your business and who are you trying to attract? Those are really important things. And then, um, then there's something that I call desires. We all have them when it comes to our appearance. We have these like deep down, even if we kind of try and ignore them most of the time, we have these deep down like impulses towards a way that we want to express ourselves in a way that we want to look and want to be seen in the world. Like the, the what kind of, the woman in what dress we would like to be basically. We all have like a fill in the blank, like deep down inside. And so with my clients, we spend time accessing that um, deep inner desire um, so that we don't build something that you end up hating or feeling isn't you. And then the last part of the puzzle is, um, you know, choosing things that are flattering on you. And for me, flattering means in harmony with your innate color properties and also your innate design properties. Because in addition to color properties, we all have um, design qualities too. We're, we're, you know, bigger or we're smaller or we're rounder or we're more angular and we're like, you know, different shapes and have different kind of motifs um, that kind of come together to form a different sort of conceptual feel, just like they would if we were putting in different elements to a font, you know, um, a really filigreed French script is going to feel very different than Helvetica. Um, and so we kind of have an innate language to our physical design. And so for me, um, flattering means um, understanding that and being able to choose clothing, you know, makeup, hairstyles that are in harmony with it. Do you ever have people whose idea of what their style is, is very different than what actually fits with the rest of it. Like in my mind, I'm a very sans serif kind of girl. <laughs> um, and I remember, so 
when I was at college, I was kind of a riot girl. I was in punk bands and I started a record label and my husband and I still run a record label. But um, I always had this image of wanting to look like the super skinny, very flat chested pop girl who could wear these tiny zip up things to here. And yet, not, I'm not gonna flash my boots on the stage, but I'm, I'm significantly endowed. <laughs> and um, I always kind of wanted to be smaller than I was overall. Yeah. And it wasn't what my body was. Like I wanted to wear those little tiny t-shirts, but if I put them on, they, <laughs> you know what I mean, right? I'm so with you because okay. in my head, I, based on what I'm attracted to and what I would like to wear, in my head, apparently I'm Sophia Loren. In reality, I am five foot two inches tall. So, um, and I have a very round face. I don't have that drama, those angles and that extreme scale because I love, you know, avant-garde, like really like odd couture kind of fashion, you know, enormous bows and just like crazy over the top stuff. But mm -hmm. I am like just a little softer and sort of cuter and more medium than all those clothes. So I totally get where um, you're coming from with that. And I think it's a common thing that I see with my clients. Mm -hmm. And one of the really, I think, transformational things about the work is to kind of like, separate those two and like things like that what we're attracted to you know what we want to look like what we would love to wear if we knew anything in the world that we picked would look amazing on us and then also what our innate design is kind of saying and what canvas we have to work with and just like kind of not make either of those two wrong when we first examine them and then figure out like okay how can we get the feeling that we want from this de this desired um, sort of quality of clothes um, while respecting the canvas that we're creating the vision on. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that a lot of times just has like a million light bulbs going off for my clients um, because I think it's the age old struggle, what, what works for us and what we'd really love to work for us. Yeah, you know, as you're saying that, I had to quickly surreptitiously Google something, because looking at you and talking about who you looked like, to me, it was um, the girl from Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist. Do you remember? Oh, oh I, I get that all the time, actually. Yeah. And thank you so much, because I think she's very beautiful, so I really appreciate it and take it as a compliment. Um, but yeah, it's something that people say a lot of times about me, and I definitely have some similar qualities to her. I'm a little bit shorter than her. There's a few things that are a little bit different, but we, we have similar coloring. We're both super curvy. Like you, I'm very busty. Um, you know, so I to figure out what to do with it in clothes, isn't it? Like, yeah. and actually, only two years ago did I finally go and get a proper bra fitting, and I have to say, it changed my life because... I always thought there, like, there was just always cleavage, and I didn't really like it. And when I had a real bra that actually, like, fully supports everything, and they're kind of separated and on their own and not squished together by clothing, I feel so much better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, center, it changed how things fit. It was so great. Yeah, it's, um, sometimes when I have, um, like, a date to do shopping with a client, um, especially when we've sort of done it before, I've kind of seen, seen them in person and evaluated them because a lot of times I'll do those things back to back. We'll do like a day of doing all the analysis and going through all the factors and then we'll go shopping, um, which is of course what everybody wants me to do for them. Um, <laughs> and, um, sometimes the shopping day has to start with a new bra. It just has to because I can see what's going on and I'm like, it's going to change the fit of everything if we get if we get this done so like sometimes we just have to start from there and you know work our way into looking at clothes once we've already you know like had I like took off the tag and had the lady at Nordstrom ring up the new bra <laughs> um so it's for sure something that I would recommend to anyone I personally am like crazy hard to fit I have to get my bras from Poland um, so through this work, I've definitely become, um, very sensitive to, um, some of us who are just a little outside of the range of what's normally produced, either because you're very busty or you're very tall or you're super petite or, you know, your feet are a size four and a half or they're a size 12 and a half. Um, and, um, all these things, I think sometimes what happens is as women, 
we want to like internalize that and make that something wrong as a statement about us and our like validity physically because we don't fit in between those two lines and like part of my work with my clients is just sometimes seeing like the lines are irrelevant they're set by somebody who like like isn't trying to do anything except like make sure that they don't have to produce more than x number of sizes so that they can make their bottom line like it's it's really isn't a judgment but a lot of times what works for us or what doesn't work for us or what's available for us or what's not available for us um can feel like it's saying something much more profound about our physical self than it actually is so people who aren't easily fit off the rack straight off the rack do you help them I mean, the first time I ever had anything tailored to me, I was like, oh my gosh, this looks as good as it looks on, you know, 20 year olds because it's now cut for me and not cut for a, you know, 16 to 20 year old girl. Right. That was an amazing experience too. Yeah. So um, having things tailored is definitely, I would say probably at least 90% of my clients come to me have like never had a hem taken up. I, I literally was on a phone call with a prospective client um, yesterday where she was like, well, I just have a lot of trouble with pants. And I'm thinking she's going to say like something like, oh, if it fits in the hip, it gaps in the waist, or if it, if it fits in the waist, you know, it's um, like loose around my butt or the kinds of things that I usually think of as fit issues that are legitimately sometimes difficult to ta even tailor around. Mm -hmm. But like all she was talking about was that pants, short pants, length pants are too short for her and regular are too long. And I was just like, you know, there's a, there's a solution to your problem. And it doesn't, it's not even expensive or difficult. It's like probably, you know, in the main street of your town is somebody who get the dry cleaner. You know, there's somebody who can make your whole life better on this topic. Um, so yeah, tailoring is definitely one way. Um, that I kind of teach my clients to just factor that into the equation is is that we have we have the technology we can tailor things it will add expense but sometimes it's worth it in order to get what you otherwise couldn't get you know for your body um, to to work properly for you so that's one thing um, another thing definitely is um, learning kind of where to shop or just like having a strategy around it so it's kind of like um it it's kind of like saying like and like this is i think true about me i probably have a slower metabolism than other people and i could say like oh that that means like i'm doomed it's the end of the road you know or like i have a friend who's an entrepreneur who has fibromyalgia and she could have just said okay i can't do this because i can only work this number of hours a day so we can take our physical limitations and like kind of accept responsibility for them and figure out a strategy that means those things aren't going to hold us back from what we want to achieve or we can just like you know give up basically um so i think there's a lot to that that's just kind of about having the right mindset and deciding you know having a goal and setting it and deciding to create a strategy so like for example sometimes for super petite women we just have to look at designer clothes because designer clothes are size smaller um and so um then then the question is like well, aren't those more expensive and blah, blah, blah. But there's, if I am just asking the question, is there a way it could not be more expensive? I could come up with multiple solutions to that problem. Like they don't have to be new. We don't have to buy them retail, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you want designer clothes, but you're a size 16 or bigger, then what do you do? Yeah, so so that's one of the biggest challenges and probably one, one of my biggest banner issues. In fact, before I, started doing image consulting, I really honest to God thought that I was going to start a plus size designer label because I'm plus size myself. And um, it's very challenging to find things that are like nice beyond a certain level. Mm -hmm. um, and that is still, there are a few brands. It, still, there's like certain um, types for, in my book, I talk about the different image archetypes that are the different kinds of physical designs people have. 
Um, and some archetypes are really well covered. Like I worked with a woman who was plus size um, and uh, wanted to buy all designer. And she was what I call a muse. So she was tall when she was young. She was like, had that kind of like model-esque body. Um, and she did, like, she was plus size, but she had, like, this, like, sort of large-scale, magnificent bone structure, and so we were able to buy her really beautiful things from, like, Marina Rinaldi or Lafayette um, that do make some very, very high-end clothes for plus size women, but, like, for my body type, for example, there's less, there are definitely niche designers that are doing things. That's how I manage to dress myself, um, but yeah, I mean, like if if Alexander McLean's not making your size, he's not making your size. I mean, he's dead, but um, <laughs> the brand. Um, so yeah, I mean, when I shop, it often seems like a lot of them stop at size ten, and I'm at least a fourteen, if not a sixteen. You know, yeah. depending on which which one. So I get frustrated sometimes. I know. I actually, I actually think that's the one of the harder ones is what sometimes is referred to as in betweenies because they're not quite in plus size and sometimes plus size doesn't fit them properly um and yet they're not really they like a lot of straight size really boxes them out i do think we're going to see this change and so like the on paper solution to it has actually been vanity sizing that's why we don't have like a bigger size crisis than we do is that in mainstream we have had vanity sizing such that um, when you go to designer, the same number size is often like a full two sizes smaller because that's the size that those sizes used to be before vanity sizing. Some people want to demonize vanity sizing. Um, I mean, in some ways it does make it a lot more confusing for the consumer, but in other ways, it's a response to the size of the consumers who are actually out there purchasing things. There wouldn't be anything for I mean, there's there's a limited amount for many, many women, at least in this country, I'm sure in other countries as well, um, to buy. Um, many of us maybe have heard, heard that article last year that are in, a, in the United States, our average size woman is a 16. Um, that is like the dead average size. Um, and yet a huge percentage of retailers carry very little or nothing in a size 16. Um, so there's still a disparity but if we didn't have vanity sizing like there there would be there would be literally nothing in a 16 and there would be probably nothing in a 14 and nothing in a 12 either um so uh, um it's an imperfect solution um but that's what has tended to happen so the vanity sizing so say you have a um a designer who does runway stuff and then has their like, like, like Calvin Klein or something like they have their straight retail stuff. So the retail stuff, the number that it says is different than what it is on the runway stuff. Is that what you mean by the vanity sizing? Completely and utterly different in, in every way. And huh. in fact, if there's a high probability that those things that say Calvin Klein are not either designed or produced by Calvin Klein, like when you're going, when you're shopping for them in Macy's, mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're in Bergdorf, they're really Calvin Klein. Um, yeah. When you're in Macy's, they are created by another company. Um, it's kind of like private labeling and makeup, if you know anything about that. So mm -hmm. it'll say a brand on it, but like, like my color analysis group, we have some private label makeup and we don't produce it. It's the same as many other places where you can buy that same makeup, but when you buy it from us, it has our branding and our name on it. Um, mm -hmm. So Calvin Klein at Macy's is kind of, of like that. That one may not be, some of them are, some of them aren't. I happen to know that like Tahari, for example, is um, T Tahari, which is the Macy's line, um, is also designed in-house by, by them, at least when I knew somebody who worked there, which wasn't very, was, was a little few years ago, but not very long ago. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not always the case, but often that's just like Calvin Klein basically gets paid money to stick their label on something else. And they maybe have a little control over approving the line or not approving a line in accordance with their branding. And that's pretty much it. That's like all of designer sunglasses, like, like a lot of the things that you buy with, designer names on them. And I buy designer sunglasses too. I, I will pay for the Mew Mew ones. I don't care because I want the design of those and not the design of something else. 
Um, but I do love my Maui gyms with no hinges. That's the thing. No hinges right. to catch your hair. Just simply, yeah. Right. So those may, because like Maui gin isn't like known for something else. Yeah. They may be, like, I'm not saying they're produced by Maui gym, but like, they may be like a style, like they probably have a lot more of a hand in actually designing those sunglasses than like, for example, Nicole Miller. I hundred, I know for a hundred percent certainty that the brand, the company that produces Nicole Miller sunglasses um, just kind of brings them the design for the season. They approve them and they go out with their name on it. And Nicole Miller makes what's called a licensing fee. If you've ever seen Shark Tank or something like that, you know, with certain products, they're always looking for the licensing deal because it kind of gets you out of production. Product production is very expensive um, and it's a hard business to run, especially at smaller scale. It's hard for it to be profitable until it scales quite large. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the case with designer sunglasses and lots of other things that have designer labels on them. So long story short, they're, those things are totally different. It's just like, there's nothing wrong with these things. It's just, I guess, sometimes the consumers are not educated about them um, because it's like intentional that they not know these things, kind of like it's intentional for you not to know when you go to an outlet that um, you're not seeing actual markdowns from the brand most of the time you're seeing like kind of like a designer diffusion label something that's produced to look like that designer style specifically for the outlet at a lower price point so they are lower quality which is not to say bad okay um but they are lower quality it is a different product and i think like i find lots of things at nordstrom rack that i enjoy purchasing but i buy them knowing that they it's not it's not actually on sale it's just at the price it was produced for the price point that it's being sold at okay well that's really interesting so we're gonna need to wrap up here so i feel like i have learned a lot from you just, now, <laughs> just through this discussion which is fantastic but i want to make sure that anyone who's listening and who does want to work on their style and um feels like they could use this kind of help because this is definitely very different than the kind of help I've seen offered in other places. Like, I'm definitely a different kind of stylist. Um, yeah. It's definitely way more about like, I mean, yeah, there will be shopping. Um, of course, we can't acquire anything without shopping, but it's definitely um, for me always about so much more than, than just that. So um, if you, you know, for the person who maybe has experience having a stylist before that made them, you know, like, like it was beautiful, but they, it wasn't really what they had in mind. Um, you know, there are definitely some things that I can offer. And if it's okay with you, I've had so much fun chatting that I would love to offer your listeners a free copy of my book if um, they would like one. And um, it would be totally fine with me if anybody listening just wants to email Rachel, R-E-C-H-E-L at best dress, like the best dress list, bestdress.us. Um, and just uh, put, you know, Jen Terrell or something in the subject line. So I know that you came in from here and I will get you hooked up with a free copy of my book. That sounds great. I think that would be fantastic. And just because you look so glamorous, if anyone's watching on YouTube again, um, if someone comes to you and is like, I've had this really buttoned down corporate style and I want to be more punk rock or skater, like you can help them with whatever it is they want to go towards, not just glamour, right? Totally. I mean, okay. this is my personal style and my um, my signature style. I, I definitely think there are stylists out there who kind of dress everybody like little clones of them. If you've ever seen What Not to Wear, I kind of think Stacey London's like the epitome of dresses everyone like a little mini Stacey. Um, but uh, my clients have wildly differing styles from each other and from me, and that's exactly how I think it should be. Okay, fantastic. Just want to make sure because I do feel like I've seen that sometimes where um, and sometimes again with the photographers who do shoots but bring in their own stylists, sometimes I feel like I've known people who've gone to the same, you know, through the same people and end up looking very different than I feel like I've seen them before. So, so that's great to hear that you really tailor it to what they want and what they need. For sure. Um, that's, that's definitely core to my message. And like a lot of what my book is about is finding that thing that's right for you as opposed to anyone else's style. Um, it, or, you know, what somebody else thinks is beautiful. It's really not about that. It's about what works for you.
And just last thing, I would love to hear some of the difference you've seen this make in the women that you've worked with. Yeah, so um, what inspired me to start working with entrepreneurs was um, I had a client um, who I'll just refer to as T, who's talked about in my book, who was, is like this um, incredible financial advisor um, who kind of has a mission to change women's lives around their relationship to money and their finances. And she wanted to create like a platform for herself, basically a whole new website, all video series, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but she just like couldn't even dream of actually doing it until she figured out how to put herself together. Cause she'd always felt like she just had no idea. She hated what she looked like, you know, when she was photographed and on camera at other times and she just could not get this, this platform and this project started um, until she got that figured out. And unfortunately, before she hit me, she went through three other stylists trying to get there and had that kind of ex experience that you're talking about, where of course they had taste and they knew what they were talking about, um, but they just um, were creating their vision, which wasn't her vision, and sometimes had a propensity to make her feel like um, she just wasn't beautiful enough or she didn't have good taste and like stuff like this that I think a lot of us are afraid of when we maybe reach out to a stylist. Um, and so as soon as I started explaining her to her, like just like those very technical things about her physical self, um, she, like all these light bulbs were going off and it was like, oh, that's why I always go for this. Oh, that's why I go, always go for that. And she just like, like this huge burden was kind of lifted that had been with her her entire life. And she was able to, you know, go on TV and make the videos and do the photo shoot and do all the things that were going to kind of like accomplish her dream of making a difference in the world. Um, and so for me, that is really the core motivator behind what I do. I want to kind of like, let's get this solved so that you can go like put your amazing work out into the world and go for your dreams and achieve anything that you want to. That's fantastic. And I think that is something that stops a lot of women. That and having to make sales if you've never done sales before. But again, feeling confident in how you look can make a difference in how you approach customers too, I think. So yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. That was, I'm so glad you came and spread this message. Oh, it's been a delightful chat going in all sorts of directions that I never imagined. So <laughs> thank you for that. You were fascinating to talk to and I felt like I could talk to you all day. So i um, so happy to have been here and thanks for having me. All right, great. Well, we will send people to your links and everything. We'll put them in the show notes. And I hope you guys will take her up on the free copy of her book. I'm working on it right now myself, and um, I'm going to leave you an Amazon review as soon as I finish it up. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.